Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I want to give you guys some updates for Intel's upcoming Arrow Lake range of processors. Because while Zen 5 it certainly does look very impressive indeed, let's just be honest, competition is great in the marketplace and actually Arrow Lake is shaping up to be very decent in its own right. As I've said in countless videos before, I would highly encourage you guys, especially if you're not already on the AM5 platform, just to wait for reviews and for all of the processors and products to to be available on the market as it gives us a much better idea of things like BIOS and the quality of different motherboards, how different memory speeds will impact things, and of course what processor is just plain best for the scenario that you're using. The rumor is as well, just a quick reminder, that the X3D Ryzen 9000 processors will launch much earlier than what we've seen in the past. So potentially we could see the X3D variants launching roughly in October, November time, although quite frankly there's nothing solid on that right now. But with that said, let's get into some updates to the specifications and then we'll get into the benchmarks of the various Arrow Lake SKUs. So I'm going to read out um, some tweets from one Raichu who is on Twitter. So for the K slash KF SKUs, we're looking at the 285 here having 5.7, 54, and 46E. So what does that mean? Well, basically, what this is in reference to is the P core boost, the all core boost, and the E core boost. So according to this information, anyway, the P core is operating at 5.7 gigahertz, the all core is 5.4 and then 4.6 would be the E-Core. I'm not gonna read out all of the specifications for all of the parts, you can pause, but basically speaking, versus the Raptor Lake refresh, we're looking at a regression in clocks of around 300 megahertz. Now it is possible, of course, that this could change prior to the launch, but this does look to be pretty much locked in. You will also notice the various core count configurations. So we're looking at eight P cores, 16 E cores for the 285. For the 265, it's eight P cores, 12 E cores, and then finally bringing up the rear. He, 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 I'm sorry, I'm a child. 245 uh, is going to be 6P and 8 E. Now it's worth noting that these specifications are pretty similar to the specs that I've personally leaked in the past, including the 5.7 uh, gigahertz uh, single core frequency. And it's going to be very interesting to see how these parts basically stack up. We'll look at some benchmarks in a moment. But uh, basically, to give you the Cliff Notes version, the P cores, they are improved versus uh, let's say the 13th generation CPUs from Intel, but the big bonus here is definitely the E cores. Basically, the P cores are decently improved, but the E cores are significantly improved. What does that mean? Well, in terms of single thread performance, and again, we are talking about leaks and benchmarks that are not of processors that have launched officially, but it seems that single thread performance is probably going to see a decent increase, but when it comes to multi thread, it's going to be a lot more significant because obviously that's when the e cores are going to kind of start throwing their weight around. Speaking of benchmarks, let's actually get into some benchmarks of the 285. Now, this has been leaked by Jakin on Twitter. Hopefully, I've pronounced that correctly. And these are a couple of days old now, but I've just been insanely busy because I've been launching the fitness channel, which is Muscle Foundry. Um, I'll try to remember to leave a link to it in the video description, plus doing some other normal, you know, day to day stuff. But what I will say is that according to a couple of sources I've spoken to, these scores are roughly right. With that said, we again are not dealing with final retail versions of the chip and also the BIOSes of course can improve. I'm not saying that this is going to double the scores or anything like that but there is certainly a little bit of room left in the tank especially when you start tweaking things. You know how it goes with BIOSes and you know memory timings and all that crap. With that said let's talk about the results shall we. So there are comparisons between a couple of different Arrow Lake uh, samples. So basically we have the ES2 and the qualification sample and also the 14900K. Now it goes without saying that 14900K scores are a rough guesstimate because, well, again, your configuration is going to be very much varying. But you can basically see, I'm not going to read out all of the results, but for example, in Cinebench R23, we're looking at essentially... Uh, 43,000 for the qualification sample and the 14900K is around, let's say, 36,500. So ultimately speaking, the performances 
almost around 20% over the 4900K, which is not too bad at all, at least in my personal opinion. Again, perhaps there's a little bit of loom, room, excuse me, left in the tank, but it's going to be very interesting to see how this pairs off against Zen 5. If I had to guess, and again, we are not talking about final chips and all that, but I'd probably say that Zen 5 is probably going to do quite well in single thread, but I would imagine Arrow Lake could be fighting quite well in the multi-thread. So there you have it, guys. That's just a quick update for Intel's Arrow Lake processors. I'll be very interested to see what the public perception is of Arrow Lake when it launches. Not necessarily even in terms of the performance metrics, but more whether people are going to jump on Arrow Lake or perhaps stick with Zen 5 or maybe just wait a while because... Obviously, there is the whole situation with the 13th and 14th generation processors with Intel at the moment. While the next generation of CPUs is very cool, and I don't think they're bad, I feel that there is also a really good argument that if you have, let's say, I don't know, a 12700K or a 5800X 3D or anything that's reasonably decent nowadays, most of the time you're going to be more GPU bound anyway in most titles that are really like well graphically intensive i mean sure there are definitely going to be benefits with running a faster cpu um especially if you're playing i don't know something like counter-strike but if obviously if you've got the money then great but uh, i think if you're more limited in your funds um again a 5800x 3d or something similar it's going to probably do you for quite a while so it's going to be very interesting to see how the upgrade cycle goes this time around with that said guys i think that's just about it for this particular video hopefully you've enjoyed it i'll see you soon take care of yourselves bye for now